welcome everyone. Um, I'm Carol Runyon, uh, Director of the Program for um, Injury Prevention, Education, and Research, also known as Piper. And as some of you know, we have a regular, mostly regular seminar series, roughly monthly, um, and this is the first for this fall. And I'm very pleased to have um, our guest today, Pete Gutierrez. Dr. Gutierrez um, has his PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, and is clinical research psychologist at the Rocky Mountain Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Centers, also known as Myrick, uh, over at the VA. He's also co-director of the U.S. Department of Defense Military Suicide Research Consortium and holds um, faculty appointments in our School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. So he's going to be talking today um, about military suicide issues and then entertaining questions. Do you want questions as you go, or? Okay. That's fine. And I did warn him that a few of us have a meeting immediately after, and we'll be slipping out, but hopefully that won't disrupt things for the rest of you. But thank you for being here. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I assume everyone can hear me all right. Emmy, can you hear me? All right. Um, so I didn't realize I was the inaugural speaker for the school year. That's kind of cool. I like that. Uh, as Carol said, I'm going to uh, tell you about the Military Suicide Research Consortium, or MSRC. Any of you who have worked with the DOD or the VA know that we love acronyms. Uh, some get spelled out. Some get spoken. Um, I try to minimize the number of acronyms in presentations that I give, but I'm sure there are a few in there, and so... If I see blank stares, I'll explain. If you don't have a blank stare because you're really good at looking interested, even if you're confused, just raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, what the heck does that mean? And I will explain. Uh, and as Carol said, I'm happy to take questions at any point. So feel free to jump in when you want more information about any point. All right. So the MSRC... Um, is a Department of Defense funded effort, and it's funded through the office whose name I'm drawing a blank on now, and that's okay because they're not here. They won't know. I can't remember which one of the many ones it is. But anyway, we, um, we were originally funded in 2010. It was a five-year, $30 million grant, um, and then uh, we got... Um, Funded again, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But before I get into that, um, let me tell you a really broad overview of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. So the, the DOD approached uh, me and Thomas, my, my friend and colleague, Thomas Joyner, uh, who's at Florida State and co-directs the consortium with me. And they basically said, um, have you ever given any thought to forming a research consortium to focus on suicide? And we said, no. And they said, you should. Sometimes the DOD is a little opaque about what they're looking for, so it took a lot of back and forth to kind of get a sense of what exactly they thought we should propose to do. And every time we would pitch something to them, they'd say, that's good, think bigger. So we'd go back and work for a while. We'd come up with what we thought was like the biggest, most audacious thing we could possibly suggest to them. We'd pitch that. They'd say, that's good. Think bigger. So we eventually got to what you see up on the screen, um, which is a consortium with um, a pretty large, stable infrastructure intended to support oversight of research on the full spectrum of the suicide problem within the military, from uh, community-level prevention to postvention, which are services for those who have lost someone to suicide, and pretty much everything in between. And in order to do that without losing our minds, we created this core structure. So... Core A, which Thomas and I co-direct, is the executive management core. At the end of the day, the buck stops with us. So anything that anyone else screws up, uh, we're responsible for. And fortunately, our folks don't screw up very often, so that's nice. Uh, then we created our information management core. So they have responsibility for maintaining our website, for uh, keeping our uh, article repository up to date, helping to respond to requests from the media, 
Um, we have uh, what we call a rapid response function to generate white papers, which um, probably 90% of the requests come from senior DOD leadership, uh, although anyone can submit one. And we've gotten quite a few recently from graduate students who we've politely told to go away and do your own research because we're not going to do it for you. Uh, the very first one that we ever got was while I was in D.C. for a meeting at the American Psychological Association. Thomas was out of the office somewhere else for some other meeting. And at 7.15 in the morning, as I'm walking over to the meeting at APA, I just happened to glance at my email on my phone, and there was a white paper request on behalf of the Surgeon General of the Army. And he needed an answer by 5 o'clock that day. We did it with about 45 minutes to spare, and then I went to the airport. Uh, so those are the major things that, that Core B manages. Then our Core C is our database and statistical management core. That's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the piece that's not self-explanatory, which I will talk about in detail later, is they manage our common data elements, which is a requirement that we have of all the studies that we fund. And uh, so we have this large repository of data that have been collected with the same measures across all 21 studies that we funded in the first five years of our existence. Uh, so um, both Core B and Core C are physically housed at Florida State University. Ashby Plant, who's a professor in the Department of Psychology with Thomas, directs Core C. We don't actually have a director of Core B. We used to. It had a slightly, actually a dramatically different function when we first were formed, which we phased out because it just wasn't cost effective. So Thomas and I also technically oversee Core B as well. And so far, we've gotten away with this, so I probably shouldn't say that in public too often. They know that. Um, and the entire infrastructure is intended to support our successful research program. Okay. So, as I said, our first funding period, first five years, was 2010 to 2015. We actually got two no-cost extension years, um, which is probably not terribly surprising given how big this thing is. The first one was easy. They, they actually told us all we had to do was ask, and it was guaranteed. The second one we had to apply for, but we knew we would get, and we did. Um, so that was $30 million. We didn't get all $30 million at once. I forget how it went, but it actually took three or four disbursements before we ultimately hit $30 million, evenly divided the funds between here and Florida State. Uh, that supported our <coughs> national research program and our national training program. And the training program was comprised of support for postdoctoral fellows, including four uh, postdoctoral fellow pilot studies here uh, in the Myrick that we funded. Uh, we started uh, pre-conference training days at the American Association of Suicidology's annual conference. Uh, I'll talk about all this in a bit more detail later. And we also funded dissertation completion awards. Um, and so the national re the research program and the training program all focus on military suicide prevention. Okay? Um, however, there's a lot of latitude in terms of what can be done under, under that big umbrella. <coughs> This was our research portfolio for what we now refer to as MSRC 1.0, first five years, because now that we're into our second period of funding, we call that MSRC 2.0. Um, so our 1.0 portfolio was divided between prevention, assessment, and intervention studies. Um, I don't have time to go into much detail about any of these, but I will tell you just a little bit about all of these studies. Two of our three prevention studies were conducted by Nigel Bush, who at, is at um, what the DOD calls T2, and that's actually one that I don't, telehealth and technology. So they fund this center, uh, it's a research center at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Tacoma, Washington, and um, a lot of what they do is to develop smartphone applications. So we funded Nigel and his team to um, first develop and then test in a small clinical trial the virtual Hopebox application, um, which is this 
really cool smartphone app uh, that has now been downloaded, last I heard, 145,000 times, uh, which is pretty good for a mental health related app. And um, in the clinical trial, it was found to result in much better kelp coping self-efficacy in the patients who used the smartphone app versus those who didn't. Uh, patients liked it. Providers liked it. Both patients and providers said that they would recommend it to either other providers, other patients. The providers in the trial also said that they are and will continue to use it with patients who weren't enrolled in the study. Um, and then Julie Cyril, who's a colleague at uh, University of Kentucky, did our only bereavement study. This was a uh, statewide uh, survey of the impact of suicide death on veterans. And um, lots of good things came out of Julie's study. The one that's probably gotten the most attention was that her study absolutely shattered a myth that the field of suicidology had been telling anyone who would listen for 40 years. And that is that every suicide results in a significant impact on six other people. Right? Um, when Julie was doing her best to disseminate the findings of her study, she started a Twitter hashtag, which was not six, because that is not the number. That's not even close to the number. The real number is more like 116. 116 people are significantly affected by every suicide death that occurs in the United States. Think about that for a second. Kind of the number of people in this room, do the math. Um, a significant number of us have been affected by a suicide death at some point in our lives. Um, okay, our assessment studies, there's a lot more of them. Um, Lori Johnson's study uh, was at uh, the Louisville VA, and um, I'll try and just hit the highlights of like what came out of major findings. The, the main thing that I'm excited about from her study was that it demonstrated that it is clinically safe to treat individuals at risk for suicide in a group format. Uh, and because of that study, we have actually developed and are now testing a group intervention for uh, veterans at risk for suicide. Mike Anestis uh, did our only National Guard-based study, um, and this was a um, uh, warning sign study, and it really confirmed the challenge that we knew was out there but didn't actually have the data to support, and that is that when active duty military are asked about suicide, they are much more likely to tell you the truth when they know that their commanders won't find out. Okay? And so that has led to all kinds of important policy implications that are actions being taken on in several branches of the military. Lots of other good things came out of Mike's study, but that's one of the biggies as far as I'm concerned. Thomas and I had our own funded study in 1.0, um, and before anyone starts thinking about nepotism, I will tell you that we went through the exact same review and vetting process as every other proposal that came in, um, and so it was totally kosher. Like, our funders were fine with it. It was cool. And uh, what we did was to look at the predictive validity of four commonly used suicide-specific assessment tools, none of which had ever been validated for use with active duty military, uh, in a very large sample of service members across all services, including the Coast Guard. We may be the only suicide study that's ever included Coast Guard members in it. We had like four, um, but they were there. Um, so two interview base measures, two self-report measures, and then we looked at their predictive validity of new onset suicidal ideation and return to care for a suicide-related concern over a three-month follow-up period. Uh, and what we found is that all four measures are psychometrically sound when used with military members. Uh, and I suppose I should tell you what the measures are. Uh, one was the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, the Self-Harm Behavior Questionnaire, the Suicidal Behavior Questionnaire Revised, and the Beck Scale for Suicidal Ideation, the Self-Report Version. Um, and at the end of the day, the best predictive validity with the easiest to use, administer, score, and interpret combination of measures comes from the self-harm behavior questionnaire, which is an interview, and the suicidal behavior questionnaire revised, which is a self-report, 
It is a coincidence, but I need to say this. I developed both of them. (laughs) And I own the copyright on the book in which they're published. So if people are all going to run out and use those measures, that would make me happy. It probably won't make me any money because the book was published seven years ago. And I'm still earning back the advance because that's just how well it's selling. Um, But anyway, you should know that. Uh, Debbie Yergel and Todd did a really interesting imaging study on veterans, uh, comparing all kinds of things that even though I read her updated report yesterday, I still don't understand because I am not a neuroscientist. Um, But what they found were some interesting differences in a whole variety of brain structure and connectivity between male and female veterans as a function of um, baseline level of aggression as it relates to suicide risk. Um, And she is now working on translating the update that she sent to us yesterday into something I can understand and explain to other people. So she's working on that. So that's the best I can do with that one. Courtney Baggy, who's at University of Mississippi Medical Center, um, did a fantastic study of warning signs for suicide using uh, an adaptation of a research methodology that was originally developed for substance abuse research called the timeline followback. And um, what she did was to recruit a large group of participants who had all been hospitalized because of a suicide attempt and conducted timeline followback interviews with them within, I think it was three days of their attempt. Um, So all of the cases served as their own controls because first she interviewed them about the 24 hours immediately preceding their suicide attempt, and then she interviewed them about the 24-hour period before that day to figure out what was different in those two days and the things that were different, which sorted into like about five or six categories, um, are warning signs for suicide. Um, So we are really excited about that. Matt Nock, who's at Harvard, um, actually, I think, managed to squeeze in four studies within the single sub-award that he had, uh, doing variations on uh, tests of uh, the implicit association test, which is a non-face-valid suicide risk measure that involves uh, seeing images flashed quickly on a uh, computer screen and then words that are either personally relevant or not relevant, related to suicide or not related to suicide. You cannot cheat on the IAT. It's physiologically impossible, I think, um, because it measures reaction time. Um, Well, Sam, it can be a homophar. did a study looking at, um, also was also had some imaging components in there, but what they were really interested in was um, whether or not individuals who um, are currently experiencing suicidal ideation uh, respond differently under cognitive stress than those who aren't, uh, to kind of look at what's the, you know, what's the impact on kind of a range of cognitive factors to uh, coping ability and ability to, to, to deal with stress. Tracy Woody and Jill Homdenoma. Uh, Tracy's here at the University of Denver. Uh, Jill is, no, Jill's at the University of Denver. Tracy's at Auburn, I think. Probably getting, uh, anyway. Uh, they did our only study in 1.0 using our common data elements, and they applied uh, taxometric analyses uh, to those data which is, um, it's an approach to statistical analyses that allows you to answer the question, is a given construct categorical or continuous? Really important in suicide research because, again, for as long as I can remember, um, suicidologists have talked about a continuum of suicide risk, right? That things happen, and so there are people who, you know, are at risk, it's very low risk, and then they sort of gradually go up, and then at some point their risk becomes really, really high. No one had ever tested that empirically. And what they found is that, in fact, suicide is not continuous. It is categorical. There are a small set of factors that distinguish people who are high risk for suicide from everybody else. So that was pretty exciting. And uh, then Jess Ribeiro did a uh, study um, looking at short-term predictors of suicidal behavior using machine learning approaches. 
And then for our interventions, I gotta go through this faster. Uh, I'll just tell you what these things mean. Window to Hope is a group-based cognitive therapy to increase hopefulness in uh, veterans who would experience a moderate or severe TBI. Um, Rebecca Bernert did a study of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia as a means of suicide prevention. Um, Bridget Monterazzo, I'll talk a little bit more about hers. Uh, the HOME study is a really innovative approach to addressing a huge problem within um, treatment of people at risk for suicide. And that problem is that the 72 hours after someone is discharged from inpatient psychiatric units is when their risk of suicide is highest. So the HOME intervention um, makes contact with a patient while they're still in the hospital, then does a visit home visit, clinician goes to their home within 24 hours of discharge. At that home visit, their safety plan is updated and an environmental scan is conducted to ensure that the home environment is as safe as possible from potential means to engage in lethal suicidal behavior. And then they maintain telephone contact with the patient until they're fully engaged with outpatient care. And their definition of fully engaged was three, they had attended three consecutive outpatient appointments. <laughs> Patients in the home condition relative to follow-up as usual, which is pretty much nothing. Um, no suicide attempts. Fewer rehospitalizations. Significantly faster uh, to fully engaged with care. Big success. Um, Kate Comtois, uh, is a suicidologist at the University of Washington. She did a, um, a study that was an update of the only intervention study prior to hers um, that had ever been able to show an impact on death by suicide. So in the 1970s, Jerry Motto, who was um, at UCLA, uh, did what was called the Caring Letters Study, where patients who had come through UCLA's inpatient unit and refused further care after they were discharged, received a series of letters over the next year from the hospital that were very brief and basically said, haven't talked to you in a while, hope things are going okay, wanted you to know that we're thinking about you. If you need anything, here's a reminder of who you should call at the hospital. We would be happy to, you know, to see you again. Patients who got the caring letters, significantly less likely to die by suicide at the end of the one-year follow-up period, five years, and 15 years later. Kate's study, same concept, but instead of letters, there were text messages. Um, and uh, the reason it's called caring contacts um, and not, wait, is that what it's called? No. The reason it's called the military continuity study was originally the caring contact study. Most of her participants were Marines. And when they first were recruiting participants and the Marines heard that this was the caring contact study, they're like, we're not interested. <laughs> and, you know, they're like, why not? And like, that's way too wimpy. Like, I am not, I'm not telling anybody I'm in a caring contact study. So they changed the name and recruitment went way up. Um, pretty cool. Uh, she got some really good good results. I haven't actually read the report. I just skimmed it, but um, they did definitely see a uh, significant effect of the carrying text messages. Um, Craig Bryan uh, actually got non-significant findings for his study, um, so I'm not going to talk about it, uh, other than to say he was looking at two different versions of a crisis response plan, which was also referred to as a safety plan. One added um, an intervention intended to increase the, the ease with which people could, re, could recall the reasons for living that they had talked about, and the other that was just a standard crisis response plan. Both crisis response conditions were much more effective than care that didn't involve a crisis response plan, but there was no difference with the addition of the reasons for living enhancement. So definitely supports the crisis response plans are an important part of interventions for suicide, um, but the RFL piece, no. Uh, Brad Schmidt uh, developed a web-based intervention called DARTS, which targeted anxiety sensitivity in individuals at risk for suicide. 
Um, fairly brief, self-paced. You can pretty much do it anywhere that you've got access to the internet. Works on a phone. Um, got significant reductions in anxiety sensitivity. Anxiety sensitivity is a significant correlate of suicide risk. Um, and so very promising and more work coming out of that. Uh, he also did a cognitive stress sensitivity treatment. Uh, similar idea, different clinical targets. Also got some good results there. Jesse Kugel tried to do the same sorts of things as Brad was doing with a web-based intervention to target anger reduction, and it didn't work. Um, Jim McNulty, on the other hand, de developed this ingenious uh, intervention um, to increase positive feelings within intimate couples about their partners. And the reason that that was the target of his intervention is that within the active duty military, relationship stress and relationship ending is something that's mentioned by something like 30% of service members um, who make suicide attempts. Uh, so I think Jim is our only PI who's not, who wasn't a clinician. He's a social psychologist. Um, and so what his intervention does um, in, a, in a completely personalized way is to pair images which evoke positive <laughs> emotional responses. So puppies, kittens, ice cream cones, sunsets, beaches, you know, these sorts of things with images of the individual's intimate partner. Right? They do it on their own. It works on a phone. It works um, on a, you know, a, lap, a desktop or laptop computer. And relatively short conditioning trials where all you're doing is looking at a puppy and your partner, a sunset and your partner, has a dramatic increase in your self-reported positive feelings about your partner. It actually strengthens intimate relationships. How freaking cool is that? Um, Pam Keel uh, is an eating disorders researcher. Um, and there's a significant uh, correlation between uh, eating disorders and, and suicide risk. And so uh, she developed an intervention to, um, to impact weight suppression behaviors and increase uh, body image in individuals who were engaging in non-suicidal self-injury and got uh, some decent preliminary findings there. Uh, Wenley and Laurel Franklin... Um, did a, a perceptual retraining paradigm for uh, patients with PTSD uh, focusing on uh, smells. Um, a lot of uh, military or combat-related PTSD, smells of things like burning rubber and chemicals and other things like that are powerful triggers for the PTSD symptoms. And they developed this, uh, this way to retrain the associations between those noxious smells and the emotional responses that actually led to an improvement in PTSD symptoms. And again, PTSD is associated with suicide risk. And last but not least, uh, Jill Levine um, did something that all of you will understand because you're in public health. She did a cost-effectiveness analysis of what would happen if the VA blister package medications for all patients who are at risk of suicide. Now, why in the heck would anyone do that? Well, it just so happens that I did this other study a while ago on blister packaging medication for VA patients at risk of suicide. Jill used my data, did the secondary analyses. She pulled in VA administrative data, um, did find a statistically significant um, difference in the cost effectiveness of blister packaging over dispensing as usual, um, but unfortunately, even though there were differences then in clinical outcomes, um, they're probably not clinically meaningful. They were too small. Uh, so it was a little disappointing, but such is life. Okay. I'm going to pause and breathe because I ran through that so quickly. Before I talk about 2.0, any questions about anything I was just saying with any of those studies or what we did in 1.0? So... Those are all in military or veteran populations, right? <clears throat> Those are 90% military or veterans. Um, a, few, a few of the studies were only civilians. Um, I think Jesse Kugels, I don't think Jesse had any veterans in his. 
Um, one of Brad's studies, I think, was only civilians, but for the most part, active duty and, and veterans. Yeah. Well, I guess with my question was the extent to which, I mean, in these studies with veterans or military, to what extent are you working or are others working to show um, its translatability or generalizability into non-military populations? Directly, we're not. Um, indirectly, there's a lot going on because, of course, all these folks are presenting their findings, publishing their findings, um, doing other research that's not with the military or, or veterans. So, um, yeah, there, there's plenty happening outside of the consortium that's, that's building off of this. Uh, but our, our funders have made it really clear to us uh, that the M in MSRC stands for military. Sure. Um, and they were even not happy about the number of VA-based proposals in our first round of 2.0 studies. So, Well, let me ask the question another way. I mean, is there any reason to think that any of your, the findings you've described are military-specific and not generalizable? No. Yeah. They, okay. they that, should that was all a better generalize. Way to ask. And, and we actually, we've got some, some publications based on our common data elements that, that support that. Okay. So we have looked at uh, measurement and variance within the common data elements across active duty veterans and civilians. And the items perform quite similarly across those three groups. So if the research tools that are being used in these studies are working equally well across those three groups, yeah. then it stands to reason that the findings will generalize from the military yeah. to, to not. I don't know if, Emmy, go ahead. I think your hand was up first. And you might mention this on your next slide, so I mentioned the setting book. But I'm curious if there is a, how your framework for um, funding and how you're defining things in the different categories. Does, has DOD given you kind of a framework in terms of their key priority areas? Did you guys develop that? Like, how it, it it's been the it's been an organic process. Um, initially, <coughs> initially we were setting our priorities for the portfolio. Um, but something that I didn't mention is that uh, part of the, of the infrastructure is our military external advisory board. So there are a group of um, group of, of researchers and clinicians representing all of the services, CDC, NIMH, VA, I think that's it, um, who are the last check on whether or not a study gets funded. And their purpose is to ensure that the studies that we fund are relevant to the mission of MSRC and also to make us aware of gaps in the, the literature that we may not be aware of. So over time, the research areas that we prioritized were based in large part on input that we were receiving from the MEAB. Um, and the challenging thing is that the priorities change on a regular basis, and they change faster than the science can adapt. Uh, so to some extent, we feel a little bit like we're always a step or two behind them, because like, we really need studies on this. I'm like, great. It's so different than everything else we're doing right now, but we'll get on that. <laughs> um, and we do our best. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jennifer Box from the Kaiser Permanente and uh, University. And I wondered about the intervention studies that you mentioned. Um, I know that a challenge within this area is finding uh, things that are well-powered enough to actually kind of say something that is scientifically mm -hmm. valid. So I just wonder how you, if the studies you mentioned, you would say they are, at least the RCTs or the prospective designs, whether they are well-powered or is that something you guys are concerned about? We're very concerned about that. Um, with a few exceptions, they were all um, adequately to well-powered. Um, so what sort of sample sizes are we? It depends on the study. The, um, the, the web-based interventions tended to have larger samples. They were yeah. easier to recruit. Yeah. Window to Hope was, was relatively small, and by that I mean, I know, in the neighborhood of 65 or so patients. Um, but 
sufficiently powered for the outcomes that, that they were um, that they were targeting. Uh, home was in the neighborhood of <clears throat> 325, something like that. I'm looking at Nate in, in the hope that maybe he heard that number at some meeting and can remember better than me. But I think over 300. Um, so are your outcomes, they are not then suicide deaths or attempts, I would guess, these are like ideation or something you're measuring? Yeah, none of, the, none of the intervention studies had death by suicide as an outcome because okay. they couldn't be big enough. A lot of the, not a lot, several of the assessment studies did. I mean, we, we for, our, uh, for our assessment study, the one that Thomas and I did, the gold standard, um, we, we did gather data on suicide deaths. Um, trying to think who else? Uh, Kate's um, Military Continuity Project uh, gathered data on suicide. They, they definitely had some deaths in their uh, study. I know because I saw the adverse event reports. Um, Debbie's was too small. Courtney's did. Um, I don't know that they had any deaths, but they were definitely tracking that. Yeah, that's the that's a perpetual challenge in suicide research. Is suicide statistically is such a low base rate behavior that it's almost impossible to have death by suicide as an outcome in any study because your sample size would need to be like twelve thousand in order to be adequately powered to detect differences in that. I work on a study where the sample size is 12,000 right now. Well, there you go. At Kaiser, so that's why I wonder, that. I was like, I wonder if they're doing anything kind of comp- you know, comparable to, to what we're doing yeah. in the military setting. Um, we're not. Um, okay. Army Stars is. Okay. Um, and we work with them, but yes, ma'am. Quick question. Do you recall if there's any variation of benefit outcome between the text messages versus the handwritten um, there has that that hasn't been looked at. No. Um, it's an interesting question. A question. Yeah, and um, it's interesting. So, so Kate did the, the text messaging study. Uh, there was another DoD funded funded study that looked at emails, um, and then there was a there have been a couple of postcard studies that have been done in other countries. So, Kate's actually organizing a symposium for an upcoming conference to pull together everyone who's done caring contact kinds of studies to like talk about these things. And so I don't know if that'll lead to a collaboration where they share data with each other and try and, and look at effectiveness across, you know, type of, you know, delivery of the caring context. Um, I'm sure they're thinking about that because that's a great human contact. Right. All right, so MSRC 2.0 officially began in 2016. They um, apparently think we know what we're doing. No, we do. Uh, So this was another $30 million award. uh, And this time um, we have the potential for another $10 million in what they're calling out period funding. We... We learned from the first time around and decided that no ask was too crazy or too audacious. So when we submitted the 2.0 proposal, we put in for $50 million. Like, why not, right? Um, and so they cut back to 30 with the potential for an additional 10. Um, again, National Research Program and Training Program. We have added something pretty exciting uh, to the training program, and that is a jointly sponsored Army STARS MSRC postdoctoral fellowship. Army STARS is the Army study to assess risk and resilience in service members. Um, They are the other large DOD-funded suicide-specific study that's out there. The co-PIs on uh, STARS are all across the country, but Matt Nock and Ron Kessler are both at Harvard, uh, which is where the bulk of their data analysts live. Uh, so, um, our two fellows who have, are just three months into their fellowship are physically based at Harvard. And what they're doing is working at the intersection of epidemiology and clinical science. So they are taking STARS data, MSRC expertise on clinical interventions and doing a whole series of cost-effectiveness analyses to answer questions of, well, if this intervention that MSRC 
determined to be effective, was applied to this group of high-risk suicidal soldiers, what would the benefits be in terms of lives saved? What would the cost be to provide that intervention? Uh, you know, those, those sorts of questions. And then we, we had a, a meeting with them two weeks ago, which was the, they started in August. This was the earliest. We could all be in the same place at the same time, which tells you something about how crazy our schedules are. And uh, we came up with what seemed like a perfectly reasonable question. And then, you know, the, they, they're like, no one's ever done that before. We were talking about um, the costs associated with providing an intervention. And it was all like dollars, right? Because that's how you do cost-effective analysis. And someone said, well, I wonder what the costs are in terms of the time that it takes for clinicians to get trained and then to stay adherent to the intervention." And everyone got all excited about it, and then Ron said, I've never heard of anyone who's done that before. And if Ron hasn't heard of anyone who's done that before, no one's done it, because, like, Ron's a freaking genius. Uh, so we don't know if it's possible, um, but the fellows are going to look into it. And so we may add that to the mix, which would be, you know, really pretty exciting. Um, still doing the pre-conference training days. I didn't really say much about those. So for the last six years... Um, we have been offering a full-day workshop uh, prior to the AAS conference for <laughs> trainees at any level, so graduate students through postdoctoral fellows and residents in any discipline related to military suicide prevention. So there may be people who don't know what AAS is. American Association of Suicidology. I thought I said that at the beginning, but you've forgotten because I've thrown so many acronyms at you. So it's the, it's the largest U.S. professional organization for those of us who do suicide prevention work. Um, so we have now trained about 135 uh, folks uh, across those uh, training days. A couple of them are now um, uh, in tenure-track faculty positions and still doing military suicide-related work. Um, so we've got a lot of success out of that. We're continuing the dissertation awards. Um, okay, so our 2.0 studies that have been funded to date, um, two are up and running. The first, uh, Sara Nazem, who's a colleague of mine here in the Myrick, is the PI on that. Um, and uh, Sara's looking at um, the, the shut-eye uh, intervention. So this is a, a web-based uh, insomnia treatment, and um, there's like a whole snapshot of the study, but we, I, I'm going to do the thing that annoys me when presenters do it. I don't have time to read all this to you. Um, the main, well, lots of things I could say. We had one sleep intervention study in our 1.0 portfolio. It was a disappointing study. So we are hoping that Sara will do a much better job with hers because we suicide and sleep problems are huge, uh, particularly for the military and veterans. So we are counting on Sara to um, do a nice job and give us much better data than we got from the first study. Mike Anestis, who you may recall, was a 1.0 funded PI, is again uh, getting funding from us in 2.0. And Mike is, again, going to be focusing on Mississippi National Guard members because he's formed this really great relationship with them, and so it makes sense to do that. And what Project Safeguard is going to look at is variations on lethal means counseling, where um, this was an interesting one. The design that he originally proposed was much less complex than what he's been funded to do because our advisory board wanted him to make it more complicated. Uh, so he's now going to have lethal means counseling with the provision of gun locks, lethal means counseling without the provision of gun locks, and the comparison condition is also going to be with or without provision of gun locks. So the number of comparisons that he's going to make is insane, um, but he'll be adequately powered for it. Really looking forward to, to seeing what he gets uh, with that study. Uh, so those two studies came out of our first request for proposals, which um, was in uh, 2016. Uh, so Mike and Sara got their awards like in December of last year. Um, we have done a second RFP, um, <coughs> and funding decisions were made in September. 
So these are the studies that are uh, currently going through the contracting process to, to get underway. Um, Jess Ribeiro, who again had 1.0 funding from us, is, uh, was a postdoctoral fellow when she did that small study um, in 1.0. She's now an assistant professor at FSU uh, and has uh, been given funding to, again, apply uh, machine learning approaches to um, data from military primary care medical records uh, to try and identify algorithms for uh, distinguishing between those who engage in suicidal behavior and those who don't. Um, Brad Schmidt uh, is going to be doing an RCT at uh, Fort Campbell in Kentucky, um, which again is going to be a web-based intervention uh, trying to increase a sense of belonging in service members who are at risk for suicide. Um, We're also funding several uh, smaller projects. These are capped at $150,000 to do um, secondary analyses of the common data elements. So David Vogel at Iowa State is going to do some analyses on measurement invariants that are <laughs> different than the ones that I was talking about a little while ago. Uh, April Smith at Miami University um, has proposed a really interesting uh, set of analyses to look at uh, interoceptive deficits. Now, does anyone know what the heck that means? Yeah, I didn't think so. Nate does. Uh, so uh, interoception is our ability to be aware of our bodies in space and, and like how our bodies literally feel. And there's research that supports that individuals who engage in non-suicidal self-injury and who make suicide attempts are less aware of their bodies than people who don't. And so she's come up with a really creative way to look at interoceptive deficits within our common data elements to see if there are uh, more fine-grained distinctions that can be made between people who think about suicide, people who make suicide attempts, people who only engage in non-suicidal self-injury. Our advisory board, when we met with them late last year, said, you know, it would be really a great thing to do some long-term follow-up of some of the more successful 1.0 studies. So we added that to the request for proposals, and four of those studies have now been funded. These are also small, also capped at 150000 uh, So Jess is going to uh, follow up on her uh, study looking at the nature of suicide risk over time. Um, Brad Schmidt's going to follow up on the DARTS study. Uh, Lori Johnson is following up on the, uh, the suicide-specific group um, assessment study. Uh, and Lori's protocol is, is slightly different than the other ones. The other ones are just they're going to recontact their participants <coughs> and administer the same measures that they used at, at baseline in the original follow-up. Lori's doing that. In addition to that, um, because these were all veterans, um, they're going to do uh, data extractions from the VA medical record to look at a larger range of follow-up questions uh, that way, which will include suicide deaths if there, if there have been any. She's also added a very small qualitative piece to this, and so a subset of the two arms from the original study are going to be interviewed uh, using qualitative methodology. So um, she gets some really interesting findings from that. And then Courtney is going to follow up on her warning signs study. So that was one of the suicide attempters, the timeline follow back. All right, let me, I kind of already talked about the STARS MSRC fellowship. So what I will just highlight for here is uh, Sam and Kelly are, are the first fellows who we funded. Um, they're, we're really disappointed in them. You know, they are such slackers. The first manuscript uh, based on their fellowship work has already been submitted for review. They started in August. Uh, when we met with them two weeks ago uh, to plan out the year, we came up with seven more manuscripts that they're going to write. Um, and those were just like the main ones that were really, really important to us. They'll do more than that. Uh, and we are now advertising for a third fellow for the 2018-2019 training year. So if you're looking for a postdoc, uh, years, well, a year from now, um, 
than mine. Follow up with me. I'd be happy to uh, tell you more about it. Um, so I already told you the purpose of what they're doing. In addition to what we hope will be stellar mentorship from all of us, they're also going to take a couple of mini courses at Harvard on uh, health decision science and use of triage software, which is the primary software tool for doing these kinds of analyses. Um, and that's the, the mentorship team there. So as I said, Ron and, and Matt at Harvard, myself and Thomas, and then two other faculty at Harvard Medical School, uh, Drs. Uh, Lockerbill and Kim. Um, okay, let me wrap up and tell you just a bit more about the common data elements. So um, Ashby is our uh, data core director. And um, we made some, some changes to the common data elements between 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, we expanded the number of items um, from 61 to 102. And the main reason for that is that um, NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, has what's called the Phoenix Project. Uh, or Phoenix, depending on, on who's saying it, uh, which started as a common data elements project for genetics research. And it was so successful for that that they've now expanded it to many other uh, areas uh, within their portfolio, including suicide. So I was part of the team that helped develop the, the measures for the suicide-specific um, Phoenix tools. And so what we did was to do a crosswalk between our common data elements and the Phoenix suicide tools, and we added items from Phoenix that weren't already represented in our common data elements. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, we've created a common demographics form, which we're now requiring all of our new uh, 2.0 studies to use, in large part because of the frustrations that Ashby faced dealing with the 1.0 data in trying to knit the data together when she realized that different people, different studies were gathering demographic data in really different ways um, and they weren't all gathering the same data and things were coded differently and it was a nightmare so hopefully this will address that nightmare. Um, and the other change that we made is in, a, in addition to requiring the use of our common data elements we are strongly recommending to our PIs that if they have variables for which there are Phoenix tools, that they use the Phoenix tools because that will assist with data aggregation going forward. We have a new core in 2.0, which is our dissemination and implementation core, which uh, Kate Comtois at University of Washington runs. Uh, Kate is um, part of a small group of suicide DNI experts in the whole world, and she's also just a wonderful human being and a good friend, um, and so working with her is a delight. She has formed, uh, well, Cordy has formed a readiness working group with representation from a large range of relevant DOD um, and VA centers, uh, and they, they are working to review all of the 1.0 study findings looking for opportunities for creating um, you know, deliverables out of those beyond publications and presentations. So things like, um, things like clinician toolkits, policy recommendations, uh, you know, those sorts of things. Um, they're also working closely with the Society for Implementation Research Collaboration, which is a relatively newer uh, professional association um, that has representation across wide range of, of DNI areas. The Readiness Working Group has been very busy um, developing uh, a rating form that they use for all the, the 1.0 studies. They've come up with protocols for how to review them, how to make recommendations back to them. Um, and they've had multiple meetings. Um, so where are we going from here? We are going to release at least one more targeted request for proposals. Uh, we still have research program funding that we need to, to allocate. Um, one of the changes and priorities and recent asks that came out of a meeting with our, our colleagues in the DOD was tools for commanders. Um, they are repeatedly being asked, you know, well, what should we tell line commanders they should do uh, about folks in their units who are at risk for suicide. 
like, you guys have got all this data, you're doing all these new studies, like, give us something we can give to commanders. Um, we haven't quite figured out what that's going to be, but we're working on it. Uh, in fact, I thought we had a conference call about that this morning. It turns out it was rescheduled for the 20th, and nobody told me. Sorry, I'm only the court, you know, the director, whatever. Um, we are also responding to a request from the Marine Corps to help them with a vexing problem they have, which is uh, suicide among Marine recruits. Um, if you're not familiar with how the Corps works, uh, Marine recruits are in basic training. Okay? But different than all the other services, you don't call yourself a Marine until you graduate from basic training. So you are a recruit until you make it through the crucible and you graduate. Until then, you're not a Marine. Uh, so anyway, they have asked us to help them figure out how to do a, well, actually how to screen for suicide risk in Marine recruits. So we're working on that, um, which is likely going to mean spending a lot of time in San Diego, which is good, and Paris Island, South Carolina, which is not as good. Um, that's okay. And then most recently, um, we have been uh, asked by the Air Force to um, become, well, to work with their, a newly stood up um, suicide prevention program work group. So I went out to Joint Base Andrews last month for a two-day meeting um, where uh, we were charged by the two-star general under whose uh, command uh, the suicide prevention program falls to develop big, audacious goals, um, bags, uh, for preventing suicide in the Air Force. And so um, it was one of the most productive meetings like this I've ever been to, and there have actually been regular follow-ups to it. Uh, last week, um, the vice chief of the Air Force, the four-star general, was briefed by General Johnson, the two-star who put together this group, uh, on the recommendations that came out of it. And the four-star is thrilled and said, get to work and let me know what resources you need to get things done. And one of the things, there's a lot about this that is exciting, but the thing that I'm the most excited about is one of our big audacious goals is to institute an Air Force-wide change in the policy around the privacy of mental health records. Because currently, if an airman tells a provider that they are thinking about killing themselves, the provider has to report that to their commander. As a result, airmen are routinely not reporting. And they're talking to their significant others. And they're being honest with their significant others, but they're telling their significant others, you can't say anything to anyone about this or it's going to jeopardize my career, including individuals who the next day have died by suicide. So stigma around suicide we know is a huge problem. We know that for the Air Force, it's directly contributing to deaths. And so if we can get that policy changed so that behavioral health records have the same degree of confidentiality as physical health medical records do, we think we can dramatically impact um, stigma. We can dramatically increase the rate at which airmen are being honest with their providers about their suicide risk. And we can have a huge impact on deaths by suicide in the Air Force. So stay tuned. Um, that's my email address. Uh, I'm not hard to find. I've also got a university email address, uh, which is typical uh, UC Denver format. Um, that's our website. All kinds of interesting, I think, interesting resources on there. If you have questions that you haven't had a chance to ask me since I've now left a minute, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, you know, I'm just south of here. Uh, so I'm easy to find, uh, and as Matt will tell you, I'm even willing to come over early for things to sit down and chat with people. So uh, thank you for your time and attention. Um, this is how I spend 75% of my time. <laughs>
work with that from the beginning? Like, how is that happening? Uh, through a range of strategies. Um, the, the commander's tool ask we haven't figured out yet. We're, we're still we're working on that. Um, but our, our overall DNI strategy is that we, we need to translate study findings into actionable deliverables, which are going to look different for, for every study. So that's really what Core D is tasked with, with doing. Um, that may lead to some of the targeted uh, requests for proposals that go out in the third one. So, you know, there, there might be some tool that we think can and should be created from one of the studies that we've already done, but the amount of work that would take to do that really would require funding. And so we might just, like, ask the team, please put together a proposal, and tell us how much you think it would cost to do it, and then we, we would fund it as part of the research program. Um, we, when we were uh, at Harvard meeting with our fellows, we, we talked about taking all of the articles that they publish and producing a, a one-page synthesis with policy recommendations from each of those, which will then brief up the chain of command within the Department of Defense. Um, a lot of the, um, or most of the intervention studies in 1.0 developed treatment manuals, and so we are making treatment manuals available, and Core D is working with those PIs to develop training materials tied to, you know, their manual and, and their intervention, and so then we, and again, we might look at ways where we fund trainings or at least advertise trainings, um, so those are some of the ways, um, but the whole reason that we have that Core D is because this isn't our area of expertise, but that's Kate's. So questions like this come up, and if Kate were here, I'd go, what should we do, Kate? <laughs> She's not here, so I have to do my best to speak for her. All righty. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank you. And Carol asked me to mention 